Cassie Christopher, really enjoyed my conversation with Cassie. So, so, ah, just great energy. She, she's a, a dietitian by trade, but she sees just so much more than that. Uh, I, I opened the conversation about just food obsession and how people have such a difficult relationship with food. She talked about a, a phrase that she derived herself. I'll tell you what it is. It's uh, cultural wounding. Just kind of let that soak in for a moment. Cultural wounding and what that does. Is the problem the food? Is the problem the availability of bad food or is it the consumer? Loneliness, you know, shame, uh, just general mental health issues. Just a wonderful conversation. She's got these four uh, pillars in what she calls courage to trust, where she takes a step back from what the person is eating, you know, calming your nervous system, self-compassion. The other two are really cool. I'll I'll save it for you. Uh, You'll learn shortly. Just a great conversation. By the way, she also did a stand-up comedy routine on on, diet, on dieting and diet, her being a dietitian. Uh, just a, an incredibly rounded uh, person. The, the time just flew right by. Uh, she helps people with these issues now. Just a great conversation with Cassie Christopher. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Joey Pins. People ask me, how did I lose 130 pounds? The quick answer is always discipline. I started my business, wasn't paying attention to my health, was eating too much, you know, drinking too much sweets. My daughter was born. The next thing I know, I'm pre-diabetic, I have hypertension. I knew something had to change. Discipline. I, like many of you, have faced many challenges in your career, in your family, in your life, in your faith. How did you attack them? How did you approach them? How did you solve them, hopefully? It all had to have some degree of discipline. I'm also asked, how did you found and start a tech business that lasted over 25 years? Discipline. I was committed to it, enjoyed technology, didn't enjoy some aspects of it, but knew it was necessary. Discipline. Our podcast mission, how do we use discipline to better ourselves and society? Join me, please, as I talk to interesting people and discuss how they use discipline in their family, in their passion, in their careers, and how it helped them. Our podcast vision, growth through learning from others. Joey Pins Discipline Conversations. It will be light and serious. Join us, please. Thank you for consideration. Thanks so much for being here, Cassie. I'm very excited to talk to you. Why do people have such a difficult relationship with food? That's such a good question. And, you know, as a registered dietitian, it's certainly something I spend a lot of time thinking about. And I think it comes down to the convergence of different types of cultural wounding. Mm. And let me tell you what I mean by that. I think We think that we have a problem with food because we are the problem. Like we really internalize that often. Uh, We carry a lot of shame. Most people do or guilt, you know. But what I propose is that there's actually a lot of different forces that keep us feeling like that. Hmm. And without sounding like... Uh, you know, a paranoid person. There's also a lot of industry and billions of dollars uh, mm. invested in, in us feeling like this. And so when <laughs> I say cultural wounding, what I'm talking about is this self-improvement culture that tells us we always need to be working on ourselves to be our best selves. And once we, you know, continue on this path of self-improvement, we'll kind of reach that that nirvana or that, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs will reach the top of it, self-actualization, and we'll finally be happy. Uh, And, you know, and for $9.99 a month, right, (laughs) you can Mm. sign up for XYZ service, usually more than that, to help you get there. Um, And I'm I'm not against, you know, capitalism. um, And a lot of these services are, are really helpful, but we have to recognize, right, that people have vested interests in keeping us feeling like this. There's diet culture as well. And that's really the the five billion dollar industry around weight loss, and you know, keeping us believing that you know we're not going to be happy until X Y Z. Um, and then there's 
uh, you know, in my own life, I've had to, to unpack some religious trauma and this mm. belief that when, you know, that if I do X, Y, Z, then I will be, you know, good enough. And, mm. uh, and so that is another thing that, you know, it gets folded right in. So we end up believing that there's like a code or a formula when it comes to food, lifestyle, you know, spirituality. And once we crack this fo- code or formula, you know, once we perfect it, then we'll finally get these things that, w- that we want. Um, and, and that's really that cultural wounding. And I, and I believe it's stopping us from taking good care of ourselves because we're mm. always in pursuit of these goals that actually may not be our own goals. We don't know because, mm. you know, they're kind of given to us. Cultural wounding. I've never heard that term before. Have you, have you created that? I made it up. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. That's why. Yeah, because to me, it's the best way to describe these external forces. I think with food, as a dietitian, I see people with food, they're saying, I was good today. I was bad today. They're internalizing what their choices mean about their identity. And that doesn't come from them. Preschoolers don't do that. You know, babies Mm. don't do that. We are not born that way. We are born knowing when we're hungry and knowing when we're full. We, you know, babies cry when they need something, right? They, they get what they need. Mm. And, and so this, this, I'm good. I'm bad. You know, I don't know when I'm hungry. I don't know when I'm full. Um, you know, the, the, all of these things happening around food come from these, this external pressure on us. And it's really important to recognize that because when you do, then you can be so kind to yourself. You can be compassionate. And that was really important for me in my own healing journey. Yeah. You talk about how when you were younger, your parents worked and you had to eat out a lot, but as a reward, your father, you, I think you have three, three daughters, three, two sisters, and uh, he would bring home chocolates and, and he would bring home sweets and you kind of g- gained an appreciation of it almost as a reward and you kind of signalize that as something that's good. Yeah, I like to joke. I come from a long line of emotional eaters. I Mm. come by, you know, emotional eating so honestly, uh, because it it was a major way that my family dealt with being tired after a long day. You know, um, even today, uh, something difficult will happen in my life and, and a family member will go, well, can I just, you know, can I go bring you some chocolate? Can I bring you some Mm. food? You know, Mm. and I'm like, it's literally my career to help people with emotional eating. I see the love in this and no thank you. <laughs> mm. So it, it's deeply ingrained, but that was modeled for me, you know, as the way to cope. And so when I got to grad school is really when emotional eating came to a head for me. I was studying nutrition of all things and ended up at the the school convenience store every day buying a bar of artisanal dark chocolate. Anyone from the West Coast knows about Theo's. It's delicious from my local Seattle chocolatier. Um, And uh, that was the way that I kind of numbed the difficulty of the anxiety of at that time, there was so much pressure to be perfect. Mm. And I, it was coming at me from all sides, right? That hustle culture of, I just need to do more and achieve more. And, you know, and, and then I will feel good about myself. Um, in interesting convergence, studying nutrition, I had the wellness culture, the diet culture, right? Like I need to, I had, I had classmates eating kale and sardine salads out of huge stainless steel mixing bowls, you know, in class. It's like, God, if I could only be like that. Mm. Yuck. No, thanks. (laughs) Um, you know, then, then I'll be so such a good dietitian. Right. So Mm. like everything converged and I didn't know how to care for myself. I didn't. And I didn't really actually care about caring for myself. That wasn't high on my priority list. Um, I was trying to achieve and get Mm. good grades and, you know, be the best I could be because that's part of my personality. It's part of my wounding. And so 
uh, you know, it worked until it didn't. I got straight A's and then about four out of six quarters in, I woke up standing in the middle of my bedroom, screaming, feeling like someone was chasing me, you know, with an ax or a hammer, like my <sighs> heart is just beating so hard. And that's what happens when you're not caring for your, you know, mental or physical health at all. And not to say, oh, anxiety, you know, is someone's fault. I'm not laying that shame on anybody's feet. But for me, I wasn't doing anything to care for myself, but eating chocolate. And that obviously, you know, wasn't working. So that's when, you know, I wish I could say that was the turning point. And then I figured out, you know, what was going on. But no, it was many years later that I finally realized that all of that striving and shame I was carrying was making me sick and unhappy and unwell. And I started to unpack how I got there. I saw it in my clients. The people who were successful were the ones who were also unpacking, you know, how do they get where they are and how can they move forward towards what they actually want? And I started to do that work myself. And I, and I discovered all of these cultural wounds I was carrying that were stopping me from taking actual good care of myself, right? Because in grad school, I was disciplined. That's what I said. I love this idea of talking about discipline. I was disciplined, like, and it worked. I got good grades, right? But that discipline was slowly killing me. It was mm. not helping me. Um, so I had to unpack the cultural wounding before I could find discipline that actually benefited me and allowed me to take good care of myself. You know, the more you say cultural wounding, it's interesting. My my father's Italian, so I spent a lot of time in Italy. And, you know, my relatives would argue over who got to feed me, you know. And so, you know, we did everything around the table. Uh, and Nobody was overweight over there, Kessie, right? And we ate, yeah. it was a lot of greens. It was a lot of, you know, people have this American, Italian, you know, it's like big bowls of pasta, not the case. So like, hand, you know, like a, a fistful, that, that's what it was, always greens, small amounts of, of meat. Sure, there was wine and there was bread. There was locally made bread, but, but people would walk afterwards. And so I wonder is... Is it an American thing? Is it, you know, certainly they have, they don't have the obesity problem there that we do. And certainly they have a lot of other things that are not good over there. But as far as the, the kind of cultural wounding, I wonder, yeah, you mentioned before kind of the money uh, and the diet, the diet culture, and perhaps that plays more of an issue here in America. You know, I, I agree there it's different. And I imagine without knowing a lot about it, I imagine there's different cultural wounds, you know, in, mm. in other cultures and other places. Um, it, it's certainly true. I remember when I was in school, one of my professors told a story about, uh, you know, being in Italy on vacation and trying to describe to people what she did for a living. And she said that the people there just did not understand <laughs> You you help people figure out how and what to eat. Like it was inconceivable to them. Right, right, right. I could see how they would. Yeah, because they perfected farm to table. You know, I would bring my friends there from the U.S. And my uncle would have eggs in the cupboard, not in the refrigerator. And my friend's like, yeah. we can't eat those. And I said, well, those just came from the farm. Those those are days, maybe weeks old. They're not months. And like we have here where everything gets refrigerated. The refrigerators are small because they eat things that are in season and they don't eat for the week or they don't shop for the week. It's just very different there. But they still eat a lot, it seems, but just only once or twice a day. It, it's very hard to... Uh, to really kind of get that together. I um because obesity is such an issue here. I mean, there's so many ills that can be corrected here with just solving that. You know, and but maybe the solution to obesity has nothing to do with food. Mm. You know, you, you described uh, and and I'm not saying like, this is the answer. I'm saying, here's another thing to think about. You know, you described a, a culture where people were together. There were, mm. there were enough people in one place to be fighting over who got to feed you. You weren't 
isolated there. And, you know, the Surgeon General recently came out with an advisory about loneliness and how that's the, the, the biggest issue that people are facing right now. And, you know, it reminded me of, gosh, was it 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, the Framingham Heart Study came out and it, it studied this community of people in, in Framingham, Massachusetts, outside of Boston, and um, looked at you know people's cardiovascular disease risk. And what they found was kind of regardless of what someone was doing with diet and lifestyle, which we typically, you know, do work to help with preventing and, and treating uh, cardiovascular disease, but regardless of what someone was doing on that piece, if they had an active, healthy social life, their risk of heart disease, their risk of all-cause mortality went way, 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 wow. way down. Wow. So the medical community has known for a long time that this social piece is is really important. And, and that's why I'm so glad that the Surgeon mm. General is is talking about this and and activating our communities and workplaces and, you know, social circles around this. But, you know, self-care, I, again, I, I think that that's even self-care could be another culture, right, where we're told we need to, you know, buy bath bombs and go get manicures and pedicures mm. and spa days. But actually what we probably probably need is to hang out with people that we love and love us and be in, you know, these communities, even, you know, even for the headaches and the difficulties that they cause as a human, we need that. And, and I think, you know, you, that's all, that's the, mm. that's one of the most important parts of like the Mediterranean, you know, mm. lifestyle that is hard to study because when we take the Mediterranean lifestyle here in America, that cultural component, that movement component, you know, is, is a little bit harder to factor in than, you know, the food piece. Yeah. It's very, it's very interesting. The whole minute, I mean, even, even the thought of, you know, uh, cup holders in cars, many Europeans, they, they can't imagine drinking coffee in a car, right? Well, we do that here. We go to Starbucks, get it, and then go to work. They sit, have a cup of coffee, and then kind of move on, you know, and there's always that kind of, I keep on painting this picture like it's perfect over there, and it's not, but it's just very different. And I, I like what you said about you know, being lonely. And before you mentioned shame where, you know, this, this, uh, but it, people just want to kind of fight back with that and take it out with food. You know, you have these, you have this, something called the courage to trust, which is really, really cool. And it's got four pillars, you know, calming your nervous system, self-compassion, listen to self metabolism, boosting. Let, let's talk about that, Cassie, because it's really, really cool the way you brought these together. Yeah. And, and this comes from my work with people struggling with emotional eating and binge eating and finding that, you know, I don't think anyone's going to be surprised to hear me say this based on our conversation so far. I really don't think that the answer to food issues has much to do with food. Interesting. It doesn't because mm. when you feel good and calm and, you know, like mm. things are okay in the world and you're going to be okay, uh, it's so much easier to choose a salad, right? It's so much easier to go, you know, I don't need the pizza right now. Meh, it's okay. That's why caring for that nervous system piece is so important. And one of the problems this cultural wounding uh, provides is that it disconnects us from our own bodies, that we believe that our bodies are leading us astray with these mm. cravings and these hormones causing weight gain and, you know, the disrupted sleep. Like, I, I don't know what this crazy body is doing, but it's leading me, you know, down the path the slippery slope to hell is what it feels like some days for, for many people. And, you know, a lot of this cultural wounding kind of promotes that fear of our body mm. and that fear of ourself and that fear of what you might want for yourself. It's like, well, you will just, if you let yourself eat what you want, you're just going to eat cupcakes, you know? And that's true if you don't feel good. If, you're, if your brain is looking for dopamine and your brain is looking for comfort because that's how you're wired, you sweet, precious human being, right? Like that's maybe true that, you know, a cupcakes may be the thing that you want. 
But if you can get to a place where you're well rested and you feel okay um, and your nervous system is calm, then you can actually exercise that choice and rationality and set boundaries for yourself. And so that's what the courage Mm. to trust method is all about, teaching you how to trust yourself again. And really it takes a lot of courage because you're, you know, I have clients I talk to, they're like, Cassie, I know this isn't right, but I saw the commercial on TV and these people Mm. said they just take this one supplement and now all their problems are solved. And I know that can't be true, but God, I wish it was, you know, like Mm. it takes a lot of courage to keep keep believing in yourself and recommitting to yourself. So yeah, those four pillars you mentioned, the first being calming the nervous system. That's the most important thing you can do because when you feel good and you feel calm, you can make the healthy choice, you know, and and we've all been there, right? Like a lot of people tell me, well, I've had this time in my life where I was maybe doing X, Y, Z, or, you know, the, the stars were aligned and I was making healthy choices consistently. And I don't know what happened. And usually it's like, well, something traumatic or something really big happened and it set your nervous system off. You know, the pandemic, losing a job, losing a loved one, you know, changes in your marital status, whatever, like these things that happen that throw you for a loop and your nervous system, you know, can't get back to that kind of homeostasis where you're able Mm. to make those decisions. So that's why that nervous system piece is so important. Yeah, and then self-compassion. Yeah, self-compassion um, is, w- oh, gosh, if I, I don't know, you know, it's like choosing a, a, amongst your kids. I don't know what would be more important, calming your nervous system or self-compassion, uh, but they both rank up there. And, and these two things are missed, right, when we're normally thinking about behavior change. So self-compassion, a lot of people think if I'm nice to myself, I'm just going to I mean, I've literally had someone say this. It's like writing a blank check to Mm. go do whatever I want, to go eat whatever I want, to go, you know, do these harmful things. And the reality is, again, if you don't trust yourself, if you can't trust your body, right? Like that's what I'm hearing from that statement. But self-compassion is essentially, and, and it's, you know, well studied in the research for any research nerds out there, is essentially accepting how you feel and accepting yourself, the the difficult parts, the prickly parts and the amazing parts and being kind to yourself and Mm. holding space for what's hard and what's good. And it's hard to practice. It is a practice. But when you do that, the research shows it actually starts to heal the shame. Mm. You can start healing the shame from this cultural wounding, from, you know, maybe your family of origin, your upbringing, wherever that shame comes from, you can start to heal it with self-compassion. And it makes it so much easier to make healthy choices. Mm. I I always tell my clients, you know, if you're, if you're going to eat something that, you know, you know, is more indulgent, right? Whatever. We're not going to label it bad or good. Mm. Um, Savor the heck out of it enjoy it, you know, and do it intentionally and then be really nice to yourself about it. Mm. And when you do that, it actually keeps you calm. It goes back to that nervous system piece, keeps you calm, keeps you feeling good so that having something sweet or having something, you know, indulgent doesn't push you off the bandwagon. You just go back to, you know, the way things have been. You go back to the the good, healthy routines um, on, on the next, you know, meal time. So that self-compassion is a really important piece for that sustainable discipline, that long-term mm. discipline. But I think it feels, I think to some people, it feels like the opposite of discipline. Mm. It's fascinating to me, Casey, that you're a registered dietitian, so you would think the conversation would be like, you know, only you know, 15 grams of this and only, you know, a uh, thousand calories of this. But it seems to me your approach is to kind of take a step back, take a step back. And why are you doing this? You know, calming, self, self-compassion. self The next one you have is listening to yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is, you know part of learning to trust yourself again is to go, well, what is it that I actually want? Mm. I think we are afraid to ask ourselves that. We're afraid to ask, what do I want to eat? 
what do I want to do with my life? I mean, a lot of stress and anxiety is caused by feeling out of alignment with what we actually want for ourselves or feeling Mm. like we don't know how to get there. You know, I can go back to my time in grad school that I shared where, you know, I had this huge panic attack. um, And what I wanted then was actually really not the best thing for me. I was so single, single minded, so determined to, you know, get this thing, this, these, these good marks, these accolades so that I could, you know, move on to the next. Um, but it wasn't what I needed. Right. And, Mm. and I, and again, like this comes from, was I listening to the cultural wounding that said I had to hustle, I had to do more, I had to eat well in order to be worthy of love and acceptance from other people? Or was I listening to myself that deep down saying, I'm good just as I am with my imperfections? And, you know, what do you what do you want from an outflowing of that internal knowing and that goodness? And it sounds woo-woo and it takes practice. You know what mm. I mean? But like... What and I and there, there's a lot of research right now coming out, especially in the worksite wellness space, around purpose and meaning. And you know, the Surgeon General um, talked about that too with with uh, what he came out in the last year around mental health in the workplace. And m- meaning is such a big part of it. And listening to ourselves, we learn like what's important to us, what do we want, and that can guide us. Our own core values can guide us to a place where we can feel good most often. And, you know, there's a, it's, but that's horrifyingly scary when you've been led to believe that you can't trust your body. You can't trust what you want. You know, it's going to lead you down that, uh, that slippery, slippery slope to hell. I I always joke, like if I write a memoir someday, it's going to be called like riding the slippery slope to hell because Mm. I heard that term so much growing up. Um, and, and that speaks to this like religious trauma that can be a cultural wound as well. You know, like you better watch out at like just so much fear, but really, you know, we were made with callings and direction and, you know, we can find that. And when you do, I I'm living testament to, it feels so good and it makes the difficult days easier to get through. It sure does. You know, I, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It would seem to me that your approach is a bit more art than science. You know, I would say I'd push back on that because I'm a research nerd Mm. and, and I've kind of mentioned it here and there, but there is good research to support, you know, the impact of balancing your blood sugar to calm your nervous system. Mm. Uh, There's so much research on selfcompassion.org. You can find like over 200 research papers on self-compassion, you know, purpose and meaning. Like, I think it sounds like art Mm. and it, and it probably is, you know, with the, if you're getting support from someone, they have to know what they're doing and have Mm. the experience, you know, like I have that experience to guide people on this journey. Um, but it is actually all based in science. Um, and so I, I guess it's both. I don't know that it's more one than the other. Uh, and it is a little bit, it's probably emerging science, you know, and mm. understanding how our relationship with food impacts our choices and how our relationship to ourself impacts our relationship with food and our relationship to health. And, you know, now this new understanding or again, I, that Framingham Heart Health study came out so long ago, mm. but we're remembering now because shame isolates. People are feeling ashamed. They're feeling isolated. They're feeling burnt out. They're exhausted. So it's relevant again. And, you know, that, that social connectedness and belonging is actually one of the key pieces of wellness. So again, it's like, it, it's based in science and yet I don't know that it's been put together in this same way. Um, and I'm a very intuitive person. And so I, I can't help but sound a little woo woo. And I recognize mm. that. <laughs> yeah, woo woo. That's a, you know. So the science would be: these are the studies; these are what they're what the outcome is. That coupled with how you feel or, or how your colleague feels, we should do this. I think there's a certain amount of art there as well because you're kind of combining them together and saying, you know, I'll feel better when I do this. I know you say woo woo. I say art. I don't know. It's all kind of blended. But yeah. the the idea is to to get to the to the best goal. Your last pillar. Uh, metabolism boosting. Yeah. And, and this is really, yeah, this <laughs> is really the, 
uh, the medical nutritional therapy is how I've, I've been thinking about it more lately, which is like, what can we do now to optimize? So this is where you, you've set the stage, you know, it's someone's journey has set the stage, their nervous system is calm. They're being kind to themselves. They're listening to what they need. And so they're at a place where they can set boundaries for themselves. They can add things in that they need. And so this is where we go, you know what, let's experiment with 20 grams of saturated fat and see what mm. that does to your cholesterol for your heart health. This is where we can add in the more dietitian y you know, pieces. But it's more it, the, the reason it comes last is because that's when it's sustainable. That's when you can keep doing it. When mm. you realize that whether or not you hit 20 grams of saturated fat for a day doesn't impact whether you are a good kind, successful human being living a good life. It just gives you data on whether or not, you know, this plan is a good one for you or where you may need more support. And so when you can have that viewpoint, um, then, then it's just so, it's so much, it's so much easier, you know, to mm. work with people when they're at that place. You've got great content up on YouTube and on Instagram, but I'm going to say my favorite was your uh, comedy routine. It was, <laughs> <laughs> I, I watched it more than once. I mean, you're very polished. I'm not going to, I don't want to, you know, your, your jokes about the keto and about vegan cookies tasting like beans. I mean, I want people to watch it. I don't want to take anything away from it, but what brought that on? It was very good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, stand up comedy um, is like a buck, was a bucket list item for me. Huh. And it's something I I was like that looks fun. I I enjoy stand up comedy. I you know I watch it on TV. Me I too. listen to it on Spotify. Um, are you a Sebastian Maniscalco of fan? Course, of course, <laughs> of course. How can you not? How can you not? Yes, yeah. yes. I, I've seen him. He's even more amazing in person. Um, yeah, I, I, it's just, it's something I enjoy. And so I was feeling a little bit restless, you know, uh, and had a little bit of extra energy and d found this stand up comedy class, um, you know, in, in Seattle, not too far from where I live and was like, you know what, what the heck, let's do it. And so I took a class, which is, I mean, again, like that is my personality. Like I'm like, right. I must learn this art form, you know, <laughs> and, and it was so fun. And, you know, I mean, nutrition is what I know. So the jokes were about nutrition and, um, yeah, it was like, it was the, the really fun part I think is like sharing your perspective with people who like are funny. There was people who are funnier than me in my class and they'd mm. go, well, what if you, you know, what if you kind of tweaked it this way or whatever? And I, I'm like, you know, that's incredible. And I think it's the power of community. What I learned is it's really hard to be a stand-up comedian. Yeah. The things that I think are funny, like people don't always, like other people don't necessarily think are funny. You have to go and you have to practice just like anything. Mm. Mm. The thing about being a stand-up comedian is like practicing happens at like 8 p.m. in bars that's and I'm a mom. Right. <laughs> and then, like, that's just right. a little bit hard to do. Um, and I, I'm not committed enough. So yeah, if anybody wants to see uh, three minutes of what I believe is pretty, pretty funny comedy about, it is. about nutrition, um, you know, YouTube walking videos, please go, go to my YouTube, Cassie Christopher RD, and, and you can watch my, watch my shot there. My, I, 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 sh I shot my shot, you know? <laughs> yeah. And at first, because the first couple of jokes, it didn't hit very well because they weren't quite sure where you're coming from. And then you yes. kind of let, okay, this is going to be the theme. This is what I know best. This is what I, you know, and you groove them into it. And then they were laughing just as I was. And, uh, uh, it was time well spent, and uh, I really, I really, really enjoyed it. Thank what do you, you, there's all these kind of, uh, what do you think about intermittent fasting? I know you get this question a lot. Of course I do. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? For some people, that might be the way. If you're, that's the thing with any of these things, right? Like <laughs> there's no one size fits all. Right. right now, intermittent fasting is the fad. So pretty much anything you read on the internet is going to say, oh yeah, you know what? Intermittent fasting is the solution to like mm. having an itchy big toe or whatever it might be, right. you know, like intermittent <laughs> fasting. 
And, you know, it's not really that kind of panacea. And the research actually shows that intermittent fasting can increase your stress hormone cortisol levels. It is hard Mm -hmm. on the body. And so for people who are experiencing a lot of stress and exhaustion, I usually don't recommend it. If they're experiencing a lot of, um, if they're struggling with emotional eating or binge eating, it usually will cause, you know, the restriction ends up leading to more eating later on. Mm. Um, you know, for, for people who don't really think about food that much in their day and, you know, like having a time window that reminds them to even eat and think about food, like that could be really helpful, you know? So, so for different needs, different people, I think it can work. It's never really recommended for women in the childbearing years Mm. because it can, it can, mess with fertility, you know, so again, like it is not this panacea, but, and yet also, you know, there's research that shows even something as simple as a 13 hour fasting window. So what that would look like is, you know, you eat dinner at six, you eat uh, breakfast at seven. I think I'm doing my math right. You know, 7 sure. a.m. So, so that can decrease risk of breast cancer recurrence in breast cancer survivors. So like it doesn't have to be this super extreme version. Right. It might just be a little bit more thought, a little bit more intention. And that's mm. intermittent fasting. You know what I mean? So I think that anything that's super restrictive and makes you feel like you are failing when you deviate is probably not helpful for you as a, you know, for the individual person, but some people can do intermittent fasting and experiment with it without feeling like that. Mm. And it doesn't make them any better or any worse. It just means maybe it's more okay for their biology. So I have no answers for you. Yeah. (laughs) It's not one size fits all. Yeah. I, I've been intermittent is. fasting for a long time. I just I, I just got so used to it. I just stopped eating yeah. around five or six and I don't eat until mid or late morning. And I drink yeah. a lot of water. Uh, you know, and it just it just works for me. But I know people who who have to need a big breakfast, need that big cup of coffee and and you know it it's not one size fits all. I always have like these three pillars of, of health. I always just say, you know, what you're eating, nutrition, sleep, and exercise. Now, Andrew Huberman would add, he'd add uh, sunlight and he'd add water. You know, he'd add a couple more things. But how do you feel about those as kind of the essentials? Yeah, I love it. I, I really do. And, you know, I think if you're, if that's enough for your mental health, then that's enough, but it may Mm. not be in this, you know, day and age. And so, um, I might add things like prioritization and boundaries and, you know, getting connected to your purpose so that you can keep going. You know, Mm. if you don't, I'll tell you, it's easy for me to like cook a really delicious salad that I love. You know, it's not boring at all. Uh, it's, it's, you know, tasty and I can get excited about it. Can you see it in my face? I'm like, "Mm -hmm, yes, we can do this. What's harder for me is to get my, you know, regular movement in like, Mm. that's the thing that's difficult for me. And, and so, you know, for me, when I can connect movement to, I love feeling expansive. I love feeling proud, you know, so that means go on going on hard hikes and scheduling those in. And it means going to a strength and conditioning class where I'm like, I can't believe I just did that. I am mm. so amazing. You know, like the, those connect me to what makes me feel good. And then, it, and then it keeps happening. Right. Because I'm like, well, I got to hit Amy's class on Tuesdays. I can't miss it. It's too fun to miss out on. Um, and, and that keeps that sustainable. Um, so, you know, for, for people who, we all have our things that are easier. We all have our things that are harder. Um, but yeah, adding to that list, maybe some, some purpose, some meaning making Mm. and connecting to your values and then, you know, learning the boundaries and the prioritization. And all of that comes when you deal with your cultural wounding, when you can go, Mm. wait a minute, how does it serve me that I'm working, you know, 60 hours a week and getting paid for 40? It really doesn't. So let's change that. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, it comes back to cultural wounding. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, you know, my story, you know, I started my business in the 90s. I wasn't paying attention to myself, Cassie, and I I gained a lot of weight. I was working too much, and so I got up to 340 pounds, and the doctor said to me, you know, if you don't lose the weight, you're not going to see your daughter graduate, you know. So I, this is something that I had done to myself, 
uh, the stress of, you know, running a new business, not exercising. So within over the next year and a half, I lost about 130 pounds. And people always ask me, like, like you said, like, is there some pill I can take, right? Is there some, so then I could do quick. And I just say the answer is discipline. I got focus and discipline. I put myself here. I'm going to take myself out. I didn't really tell anybody I was doing it. I just started doing it, eating less, eating better, exercising, et cetera. So how does discipline play a role in your life? I like that question. And also, can I notice something from your story is it sounds to me like the purpose of being around for your daughter's graduation Mm. was a huge motivator for you, you know, and allowed you to be disciplined. Um, And so, you know, for anyone out there who's like, gosh, I can't, I can't be disciplined like Joey, Mm. um, you know, what's your purpose? Why, why be disciplined? Um, And then how does discipline fit into, you know, what I'm talking about today? And that is, I noticed this really interesting thing with my clients and and with myself as well. And I'll give you an example. I, I had a client who, um, really didn't want to drink Diet Coke because she felt like it didn't make her feel good. Um, but she loved Diet Coke. <laughs> and that was like her, I'm going to go through drive through and I'm going to get this Diet Coke, um, you know, when, when I'm stressed out. And, and from the outside, it's kind of like, okay, what's really the problem with Diet Coke lady? Like, but for her, like it actually gave her headaches and it bothered her arthritis. Like there was something, her body was not a fan of that aspartame. And so, but like I said, she, she, she hated how much she loved Diet Coke. Like, Mm. you know, she might've even considered it an addiction. And every time she stopped trying to, to drink Diet Coke, she would do that kind of white knuckle, restrictions, like try to discipline herself, you know, that white knuckle discipline. Mm. And it never worked. She would always end up back in the drive through buying her Diet Coke and feeling so terrible about herself. You know, what's wrong with me that I can't just be disciplined enough to not eat this Diet Coke? It is literally hurting me, right? Mm. Through working together on all of those things that we talked about without even really focusing on the Diet Coke, okay? Like we never, I mean, we probably talked about it, but like it wasn't a huge focus of our work. We were working on her nervous system. We were working on self-compassion. We were working, right, all these other things. She got to a place where she was like, wow, I haven't had Diet Coke in like six months. I actually haven't even thought about it. Wow. And you know what? The other day I had a little bit of a craving for a Diet Coke. I was like, hmm, Diet Coke, man, that kind of sounds good, but you know. Diet Coke doesn't make me feel good. I'm not going to mm. drink it. So it's the, the difference between setting some boundaries that you don't feel a lot of that like panic around. I think a lot of times when people have food cravings and they try to resist them, what's actually going on in their body is panic. If they can check in, it's like anxiety and panic. And so when you can get things to a place where you're calm enough that that panic is like, well, that's strange. I'm feeling panic over a cupcake. Hmm. wonder what's going on. How can I care for myself here? You know, what are the tools I can use? Um, it, it, it's, it's discipline in its own way, but it's discipline from the perspective of support and from the perspective of, you know, this is important to me kind of from the inside out rather than from the outside in. That's interesting. So it's, the opposite of, of cultural wounding. You said it, not me. Yeah, I think so. (laughs) (laughs) You're, you're, yeah, you're listening to yourself. You're defining what success means to you, what, what you want your life to look like and feel like. Mm. And, and you're not, you know, limiting yourself based on the shame of not being enough, not good enough, not productive enough, not skinny enough, not, you know what I mean? Like Mm. by those standards, none of us are ever enough. There's always more to do, but you have to find a way to rest in peace that you are good just as you are. And when you can come from behavior change from that place, it feels so much better. It's not striving and struggling. It's oh, I forgot. I forgot that I used to have a problem with Diet Coke and now it's not a problem anymore. Hmm. Before you, you, you mentioned that when you were in grad school that you'd have 
the discipline to, you know, for academics, but not the discipline for kind of self care or self discipline. Is that is that a good description? Repeat that to me one more time. Sure. It was terribly worded question, by the way. Let me let's start that one over. In grad, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say it wasn't even a question. Uh, in grad school, you mentioned that you had a lot of academic discipline, right? You got straight A's, but then it came to a point where you stood in your your room and you said, you know, I'm not feeling well, and things aren't going well with me personally, and so the the discipline kind of divided between academics and yourself. Do you find that to be the case now? Where did you, and how did you do to resolve that? So I would say in grad school, I did not see a problem with my behavior. My body was screaming that something uh. wasn't right. Um, and my solution was to go to the student clinic and I went to like a holistic school. So there were naturopathic students and they prescribed lavender pills, which research shows can help with anxiety, but it did nothing for me, right? Like mm. that's not, it was a Band-Aid solution that made my burps taste like lavender. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> So I tasted soap through most of my day, you know, because of these pills and was still struggling. It didn't solve the problem. And, and, and like I said, I was so, I was so entrenched in that culture of wounding that I didn't, I knew something wasn't right, but I, I actually didn't care enough. I don't think to solve it. Mm. Um, it wasn't until later when I became a mom and, you know, a business owner and was, uh, you know, similar, I guess, to your story yeah. where I was like, something isn't right. You know, like this, this can't be all there is. And I remember asking myself the question of like, is this really all there is? Is this really it mm, mm. is, you know, this working hard and being stressed and being anxious and never having energy and, you know, not even really being fully present to the people that I'm with because being present is too painful. So I numb with audiobooks and, and food and, you know, like, is this really all there is? And that was the question for me that started the, the, the journey to the solution. Um, because it's not, it's not all there is. And now for me, I, I've discovered my personality is I like to ask, I like to ask that question. Mm. Um, we'll say it's my artsy side. Mm. Woo woo. <laughs> and my woo woo <laughs> side is like, really, is this all there is? And that for me is like my like, okay, I'm getting out of alignment with, with what I need to both take care of myself and really fulfill my purpose in this world of how I help people and serve them. And, and so that's kind of the question that helps me, you know, do some journaling and reset and talk to my people um, about, you know, wh where am I, am I, am I going astray here a little bit? So I don't think there's any way for me to really parcel apart, you know, taking care of myself and being productive and moving forward because the way that I move in the world takes care of me. Mm. Like this conversation, I love. It's so mm. fun, right? Like, so I'm getting some social inter some social interaction here. I'm getting to tell my story. I'm imagining that there's listeners who are like maybe being released of some of the shame that they've been mm. carrying about who mm. they are and what they do. And that lights me up inside. Me and then I'm going to go camping this weekend. And that is not taking care of myself because it's going camping with small kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like uh, we're, we're going to get it where we can this taking care of ourselves. But uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a both and, and it's a journey and it's not one of those journeys of balance of work-life balance. It's, it's a journey of like, what am I needing? Sometimes there's going to be more work and sometimes there's going to be more, you know, play, I guess. I hope that answered your question. Certainly. I, I, when I got to that weight, when I got to 340 pounds, because people always ask me, like, didn't you feel terrible? Didn't I? And I said, well, not really. I got used to it because you don't get gain it in a day. And yeah. then it was, it was after I lost it all and I would see pictures of myself and I'd see my buddies and I'd, you know, slap them. Why'd you let me get that way? You know, and then all of a sudden it's like, I, because I couldn't see what I was doing to myself. And, uh, you know, I just kept on going the way I was. And it was only until that external or the, or the doctor's 
said, like you said, you're not going to see your daughter graduate. By the way, she just graduated last year, and Yay. you know, yeah, it's 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 wonderful. But and, and again, and it's not something you do there, right? I just changed the way I, you know, worked with food and nutrition and exercise for the rest of my life. The fad diets just don't work. You have to change the way you do things, uh, and it's it's wonderful. It's wonderful now, Cassie Christopher. What motivates you? I am motivated by uh, two things that come up for me. One is the unflappable belief that each of us are inherently good and that every human being on this earth, myself included, is good and loved and lovable just as we are. And uh, a feeling, there's a feeling that I look for in my body that motivates me to keep doing something. And that is the feeling of expansiveness, this feeling mm. of being open and rested and creative. And I get that in fun workout classes and yoga. I get it when I'm journaling. You know, I get it when I'm kind of doing visioning things for my business or working with clients. Um, speaking to groups, playing with my daughter, you know, like these are the things that, that make me feel expansive. And, and I've learned that that's what my intuition feels like. That's what my uh, purpose feels like. And the more I can feel that expansive, the less I ask myself, is this really all there is? Mm. That's fascinating. I never heard that an expansive feeling inside, it, like growing, educating. Can you elaborate on that? Expansive. Yeah. So when I visualize it, it's like um, if you ever see a model of like atoms, you know, like all the little balls. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that the expansiveness feels like in visual form the atoms and how they all like are negatively and positively interacting. You know, there's a lot of energy, but it, there's also spaciousness. Like an mm. atom is, you know, the little atoms are teeny and the, the particles they make are huge, right? Like in comparison. Sure. And so it's this feeling of spaciousness and possibility and opportunity and, and calm, you know, like that's really the, the feeling that, um, when I feel that I know I'm on the right path. Um, and I, and I, that's my, like, you know, my hmm. dopamine, I want to keep feeling this, uh, kind of feeling. So, and, and I, I learned that through, if anyone's like, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm really interested. Danielle Laporte has got a book on core desired feelings and it's, um, I don't have it right behind me, but I looked, but it's, uh, it's a little bit older now. It's probably 10, 15 years old, but it's, that's where I heard the word expansive and, and my, my body was just like, yes, you know, like that feeling of like, mm. we know this, we know this feeling. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I would describe it. It's wonderful when you read something like that and it clicks so much that you yes. just kind of grab hold of it. Yeah. And you, 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 you let it, you let it kind of guide you and drive you. How do you measure success? Yeah. You know, that is something I, I think I'm always trying to figure out, you know, I'm an ambitious person it, it, that's in my DNA. I so. think I mentioned, I like feeling proud mm. <laughs> earlier. And so, you know, success can be like metrics and numbers and people reached and, you know, what have you being able to continue being a business owner in an uncertain economy. Like these all feel like measures of success to me. Um, but I think where I would like to be, uh, is feeling successful, just being who I am, you know, without striving. Uh, and I I'm getting there, you know, mm. it's, it's a journey I'm on. I, I, had this conversation with someone the other day where um, I was talking to them about burnout, which is a topic I'm talking to people a lot about lately. It's very relevant. And I got, uh, I got our meeting time confused and I was like, Oh, sorry. I really struggle with scheduling like timing it, for really? whatever reason. And she's like, Oh, are you burnt out? I know someone who can help you kind of like, ha ha, you know, help yourself. And I was like, you know, and I, I, she probably wasn't looking for this, but I said, you know, actually when I was burnt out, I would have scheduled things perfectly. 
And that burned me out because my actual personality is a little bit more nutty professor, absent-minded. But I masked that because I had to, right, in order to be the best and be perfect and be productive and da 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 da. And so now I mess up scheduling stuff sometimes. I tell people, you know, I'm sorry, can you tell me in my time zone? I know I should do the math myself, but I do not trust myself to do this time zone math. And I don't know that I trust Google either. So yeah, I don't know, right? Like, and I just have I've accepted it about myself. That is not a measure of my success, how perfect I am at managing my calendar. So, you know, it, it's an interesting question. I think it's one I'm still exploring. What yeah. does success mean to me? I know what isn't success. And, mm. and that's, you know, perfect calendar management. <laughs> mm. Wouldn't it be great if that's your biggest fault? That'd be wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, and it's not, and so I can't, I can't feel bad about that one or I'd have to feel terrible about everything else. So I just accept it. And that's self-compassion. I accept it and I'm kind to myself about it. And, you know, I work for myself, so it doesn't really, I mean, it kind of impacts other people, but not really. I I just can't get a, I can't get all hot and bothered about that one. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, success, I'm going to say, you're not going to like this because you heard it your whole life. It could be a slippery slope, right? I mean, it changes, (laughs) it changes all the time. Time. Uh, I, this great quote from Thomas Edison, where they asked him, you know, because he was boasting about this light bulb and like, have you figured it out yet? And he said, "Well, we we haven't done it, but we know three hundred ways not to do it." Yes, you know, so that's you know that's just as important. They're going to get there uh, eventually. Uh, Cassie, I'm so glad you accepted this. I was so excited to to talk to you. Um, you you're an inspiration. You've got great content. I love your your your, your attitude towards what you love and your stand up comedy. If you can, please continue it. I really enjoyed it. (laughs) How can we get in touch with you? Yeah, I would love if if someone needs help with food in particular, maybe they're struggling with binge or emotional eating. I've got a free guide, an audio guide that you can listen to when you're struggling in the moment with the craving. And that's at CassieChristopher.net forward slash free. Um, Otherwise, I talk about burnout on LinkedIn and Instagram at Cassie Christopher RD for both of them. And um, I love connecting with people and and hearing hearing stories and, you know, what's going on for for you, um, the cultural wounding you want to let go of. So I encourage anyone to, to reach out in those places. Exactly. And it's, it's C-A-S-S-I-E, Christopher.net. And we'll make sure we put it in all the show notes. I thank you so much for your time. And uh, the next time I'm out there in the great Northwest, perhaps we'll get a cup of coffee. I love it. Let, and maybe some Italian food. <laughs> <laughs> I will never say no to that. You be all well. Right. Thanks you so much. Enjoy <laughs> camping this weekend. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye now. Thank you for listening and or viewing Joey Pinn's Disciplined Conversations. Please share this episode with one or two of your friends who you think may benefit from the episode. Our website, www.joeypins.com. There you find lots of resources and you could join our mailing list. Please follow us on all our social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook podcast information the video version of our podcast is on youtube please subscribe audio is on all major podcasting platforms please follow them and if you like it please consider giving five star rating would really appreciate that would you like to financially support the podcast you can go to our patreon site consider five ten or twenty dollars a month there's all kind of plans that we have there It's like a one-time payment. What is this podcast episode worth to you? $25, $50, $100, $500, $1,000, $5,000. You be the judge. You can go to our PayPal account to do that as well. Thank you again for listening or watching Joey Pinn's Discipline Conversations.